Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com and by Hancock Whitney. Hancock Whitney is here for families, here for businesses, here for communities during this challenging time. Visit HancockWhitney.com slash COVID-19 for the latest. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. From across Louisiana, we're out to lunch with Peter Raschuti, Stephanie Regal, and Christian Mader. Peter Raschuti is Tulane University's Freeman School of Business Professor of Finance. Stephanie Regal is editor of the Baton Rouge Business Report. Christian Mader is publisher and editor of The Current. It's business Louisiana style. Hi, and welcome to Out to Lunch Louisiana. I'm Peter Raschuti in New Orleans. And I'm Christian Mader in Lafayette. Stephanie Regal is off this week. As Louisiana reopens and we continue to navigate the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, we're taking a weekly statewide look at what's happening in the world of business and finance. Have you checked your email today? Did you get anything from Jared Loftus? His name might not be on the email, but there's a good chance you got an email from Jared. He's the COO of an AI-driven email company called Rasa IO, and he's joining us for Out to Lunch today. If you're a dog, the coronavirus lockdown has probably been pretty awesome. You've had company 24 hours a day. But if you're human, single, and looking for somebody to date, well, the lockdown might have been a bit of a challenge. Lee D'Angelo's company, Dig, has had its share of pros and cons of the pandemic, and Dig is a dating app for dog owners. Lee co-founded Dig in New Orleans, and the business was in the process of an impressive expansion when COVID-19 hit. Lee is joining us in a few minutes to catch us up on what's going on. I'm always wary of hosts of shows like this who start off with a story, you know, if you're like me, but I'm willing to go for it right now because I bet there's one thing we have in common. If you're like me, you've checked your email today and went down the list going delete, 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 delete. Uh, the email from Amazon trying to sell you something you bought last week, uh, the email from some company you can't remember, uh, maybe they were the people you bought those flip-flops from. It's like this every day, right? Now picture this, a marketing email from a company that sends you information about something you're actually interested in. Uh, maybe it's the flip-flop company, but they're not sending you information about flip-flops. They're telling you about an advance in Alzheimer's research, which you actually are interested in, or a recipe for chocolate cake, which, strangely enough, you were just thinking about baking. Uh, this would brighten the whole email experience. And on the other side of the equation, if you're the company sending the email, your clients will actually open the email, read it, and appreciate you. And that's how AI-driven email marketing company Rasa.io works. If you're thinking, well, that's a great idea, it's way past the idea stage. Rasa IO has 20 employees, and they send out 15 million emails a month. Jared Loftus is the Chief Operations Officer at Rasa IO. Jared, welcome out to lunch. Thank you for having me, Peter. <laughs> Jared, the secret to the success of these AI-generated emails is their personalization. Suppose Christian and I bought the same flip-flops, but I'm interested in brass bands and the oil business, and Christian is interested in progressive jazz and football. We both get email from the same flip-flop company, but the emails we get are tailored to our specific interests. If I'm understanding this correctly, the obvious question is, how does the flip-flop company know all this about me? Where is this information coming from that allows a company to target clients so specifically? Great question. That's a, a really specific question. So um, <laughs> but between those two uh, situations, so it, it wouldn't work quite like that. So think about this. You've purchased from the flip-flop company. Our whole idea is that you're not probably buying flip-flops every day or every week or maybe even every month, right? Like the cycle between that is a long time. And so the flip-flop company needs to have something that will be able to keep you engaged so that you don't forget who the flip-flop company is, but be able to do it in a way that's not salesy. So in between transactions, so what do you talk about, right? Like you can't just send them the newest flip-flops because you just bought flip-flops, right? Well, the, the way that we go about that is the flip-flop company would, would 
would think about what other content makes sense for us to share with our customers that helps better their day or, or that they may find interesting um, that would be still appropriate coming from a flip-flop company, right? So you mentioned something about like Alzheimer's research. Maybe they found that um, wearing flip-flops while running is a, uh, you know, preventative measure towards Alzheimer's. I don't know. But, but that would be something that would still be appropriate, right? Like it's not about their product, but it is still within the realm of reason that they would share with you. Um, they're going to figure out what content they're willing to bring in to then share with their customers. And then over time, as their customers engage with the newsletter, those, those engagements will help dictate in the future. So your example of the jazz music and the football and, and those things, that it, we, don't, we don't have a way of finding out everything about you. We're not looking at third-party data. We're not going to social or search or anything like that. It's strictly based on the behavior within the newsletter to then dictate what the future newsletters are going to have for you individually. So let's say you are more interested in the health side of, um, of flip-flop wearing and Christian's more into the fashion side of flip-flop wearing, right? Then you would start to see that content differentiate for the two of you. So it would still be from Flip Flop Co, um, have the same look and feel, but, but the articles that are being shared with you uh, are going to be different based on what you've shown to be interested in. So Jared, I don't have to go where the, uh, probably where the listener's going, which is that Alexa is telling all this uh, information on us because you know, she seems nice. So it's not where it's, <laughs> it's not a big brother thing. No, no. So, so look, we've, we've learned lots of things from companies that have come before us and, and done that. Obviously, Facebook, um, Amazon, uh, all, a lot of these companies have gotten uh, bad publicity for doing things that you're like, wait, I didn't even know you were doing that, much less not wanting you to do that. So, um, so this is all based on behavior inside the email itself. It's not doing this creepy following you around the internet or or knowing what you searched for or anything else like that. This is Christian. Uh, this seems like a really interesting concept to me. I mean, I I publish newsletters, that's what I do, uh, but in the news space. But, you know, I get email like you say that this comes across in a not salesy way and, you know, a person goes and they buy flip-flops or whatever it is and then you start getting, you know, I get how it gets around the idea that, you know, I don't want to see the same pictures as the flip-flops that I just bought. Like I think I feel like people see that all the time on Facebook, but I'm also struggling to see why someone would ha want to have an, you know, uh, this thorough of a relationship with the company that they bought flip flop from. What, 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 regardless of what the content is, is like, is this the sort of thing that I want to have a really, you know, developed relationship with? So, but it sounds like maybe people are. I mean, why do people find that they want them to be the content producer for them in, as consumers? Right. So. So it depends on how much you love flip-flops, Christian. I don't know. Maybe maybe you're a big flip-flop connoisseur um, and you want to yeah. develop that. I mean, obviously, you have the ability to unsubscribe, right? And not everybody's looking right. for that. But let's take a, a, another. So flip-flops may be a, a, a bit of a difficult one, but let's take the example of, um, of a, a website that sells LSU merchandise, right? So you bought a t-shirt from this company during football season, but you don't have any plans to buy another shirt until next football season. Well, next football season, you may have forgotten where you got it from. They could send a newsletter that's not about new products, but it's about LSU sports and the things that are going on in LSU. Because if you bought an LSU shirt, you probably are interested in LSU sports. And if that company can somehow be the one to provide you with that relevant content. You obviously have plenty of places that you can go to do that, but, but not everybody is as active in seeking that out. That company can say, okay, well, you're interested in our shirts. You're probably interested in LSU. We want to be the ones to inform you about that. In some ways, Jared, this whole pandemic is uh, uh, kind of fitting. It's right up your alley in one way because people just need uh, to be on top of mind for their customers, right? Right. Well, especially now when you, you know, you, you were talking about restaurants earlier, think about restaurants. Like you, even if you love the restaurant, you're, and you went there on a weekly basis, you've now had a, a three month time span 
where that's not been possible. You may have developed new routines or new habits. And so if, if that restaurant had a way to stay in touch with you in a relevant way, but not, hey, it's Tuesday, come in for 20% off, or here's our latest item, because you couldn't go in. But if they could tell you about what other uh, chefs around the world are doing during the pandemic, or recipes that are really well uh, received at home, things that could just keep them top of mind. And it doesn't have to be a daily email. It doesn't even have to be a weekly email. Just something that is able to like reinsert their name for you to see it and go, oh, that was that was interesting. Because, you know, Chris, your point of of like putting out news and 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 writing a lot of content, most people are going to want to be like, well, I want you to go to my content. Well, what we've found is that with these newsletters, even if you're sending them to content that's not your own, you're the one that's remembered as having provided it. And so it's not just about where they went, but but who brought it to them. And so it, it's doing that, keeping you top of mind. Have you guys looked at, you know, bringing this to the market in the news business? I mean, I can imagine organizations that are large, right? I mean, mine is too small. We don't produce enough content to where, you know, I could, you know, as I understand how your the algorithm works, if I sort of load 15 to 20 stories and this thing kind of selects based on a person's reading history, you know, that could be beneficial if I'm, say, um, USA Today, right? And I produce national news about business and I'm able to select, you know, uh, all the top 20 stories that my entire network produced, right? I mean, have, have you guys looked at that kind of like looking at companies that actually provide information rather than just using this as sort of an ancillary business to what they already do. Absolutely. And it just depends, you know, uh, most that are, are hard into the content producing world aren't really looking to send you elsewhere. If they have enough of their own content, then it would be possible that we could narrow this down um, for each individual subscriber. But, but the other thing to consider is, well, well, maybe you, you don't have the resources to cover all of the news in the world. You feature your content, let's say at the top of the newsletter, and then you supplement with content from elsewhere in the world. And by doing that, you, you now start to be, you one, are able to personalize and better give a, a, a final product to the recipient, but you also get to learn more about where your, your customers or subscribers are going. And so maybe you see that, wow, they're actually reading a lot about this particular topic at this particular source, maybe we do need to consider covering that ourselves. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that you're kind of just like stepping on my business model here. I'm, 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 I'm kidding. Model? No, I'm kidding. No, we're just like, we're a newsletter business, right? So like, it's interesting to think that like, we, we it, and I'm trying to think of how other publishers might would commit this, right? Because on the one hand, it sounds really attractive, right? Like you could say like, this is another, like we do curation, we do aggregation. You can find yep. that this would be a beneficial way to get to know your audience, right? But then it sort of raises this other question in my mind, which is like, you know, best practices is seen in the newsletter business in, in the news industry is sort of like, it's got to have voice and it's got to have sort of personalized totally. presentation. So I could, I, I, one thing I'm wondering is how is this even customized when it's presented in your newsletter in a way that it doesn't just like, you know, here's a jumble of seven stories that we know you're going to find interesting, but we're not actually pulling any thread here. This is just what the computer tells us you think is cool. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought up voice because that's an important piece of it. Like for it to be a successful newsletter, you, you have to have your voice in it, I believe. And so we give you plenty of opportunity and places within the newsletter to say, hey, you know, this is Christian's newsletter. Here are my general thoughts on the stories that are being provided below. Um, you, you may have a couple of explanations of them and then it's the articles, right? So you, you as the sender have the ability to weave that thread between these of why this makes sense to them. So it's our, I think our best newsletters that go out are a combination of the, the sender curated to determine, okay, this is the pool of content. And then the AI curates from within that pool of which articles go to which people. So it's definitely not, I wouldn't say it's stepping on your business model as much as maybe just augmenting or helping you out a little. Jared, when you're out there now, you're not only selling your company, but you're really selling the concept, I guess, at this point. And, uh, and how do you measure, how does a client measure performance? And can you give us, you know, who are your clients? I mean, what, what, they in a bunch of different businesses? I think, I, so to first, to answer the question about how they measure it, I mean, it's opens and clicks. Do you see open rates and click rates go up? And then kind of as a byproduct, 
are you getting it out easier than you were before? Um, I think the customers that we have, which spread across the, um, the spectrum from, from realtors to large associations to uh, CPA firms to just thought leaders, it's, it's really anybody that has a reason or, or needs a, a reason to stay in touch with people in between transactions. And this gives them the ability to do that. Um, and the, the, the fact of the matter that you can get started for free. You can go to our website, rasa.io, create an account, start sending a newsletter for free. We let you do up to 10,000 messages a month. And so it's easy for you to kind of tiptoe into this AI world that may be a little confusing for you to see how it works. And, and then we like to think that the, the results speak for themselves. Jared Loftus is the Chief Operations Officer at rasa.io. Jared, thank you so much for joining us today on Out to Lunch Louisiana. Absolutely, Peter. Christian, thanks for having me. Christian, I'll be looking for your newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I'll be looking at your technology. Um, All right. You're listening to Out to Lunch Louisiana with Peter Raschuti in New Orleans, and I'm Christian Mader in Lafayette. Stephanie Regal is, in Baton Rouge is off this week. We're still feeling the effects of the the lockdown, and as I mentioned earlier, there are two segments of the population that the lockdown has had a big effect on, dogs and single people who like to go out on dates. Drawing the Venn diagram of these two populations uh, is Lee D'Angelo. Lee is neither a dog, nor is she dating. She's a married human with a business called Dig. Lee, welcome to Out to Lunch. Thanks so much. I've never been introduced as a married human, but you're absolutely right. Thanks for having me. I'm sure I'm sure it feels great. Uh, Dig is a dating app for dog owners and dog lovers. The concept is if you love your dog or dogs in general, it's good to weed out at the very beginning of the dating process potential partners who don't like dogs. And Lee, Dig is big. It's on the ground in 15 cities across the country. The biggest Dig communities are in New York and Los Angeles, and y'all are about to break into Europe. Um, Although pandemic life is starting to get back to some sort of normal, I'm not sure many economists are tracking the rate of recovery of the dating market, but I would think you are. So what's going on? Are we getting back to going on dates with complete strangers? It's a question that a lot of people have is, you know, am I physically ready to go out? What's it going to be like when I'm actually out on a date with people? You know, people on dig, they're getting it already. They're, they're walking their dog at least, right? And so they have to have those conversations. That's what we're really encouraging people is now more than ever, you have to be on the same page with the person you're about to step out into the world with if you're going to go on that date. You're being kind of forced to have these more intimate conversations about your uh, expectations, about your safety and your health and uh, your opportunities of of meeting each other and meeting the dogs in this COVID environment. And so it's really encouraging you to have these more intense conversations probably earlier than you normally would, but they're definitely happening. I got to imagine that the that the nature of this has even changed as the pandemic has moved through phase. I mean, early on, it was everybody stay home. And, and now there's some discussion about like, well, you know, maybe the outdoors is OK in, in limited numbers. I mean, so it seems like maybe a, a good first date would actually possibly be two people taking a walk with their dogs. Maybe they're on a pretty law, you know, wide boulevard or something like that. I mean, have you noticed that this has really changed within the pandemic itself? Absolutely. So for me, you know. I want to first and foremost say there's no dating app without healthy humans, right? Like you have to follow, you have to watch what's happening in your own community. I am the CEO of your dating app. I am not your mom and your dad. I am not your government, but I can encourage you to go out and I can, you know, in the safest way possible, if that's something that you're feeling like it's something you want to do and you have that conversation with the person you're dating. Uh, Otherwise, I can't help you there. Um, But I can provide you with as many opportunities as I can if you are taking that step, if it is safe in your neighborhood. Uh, And some of the things, yes, we're hearing from a lot of people, you know, uh, walking six feet apart. For dog people, you know, two leash lengths. That's uh, pretty easy to view (laughs) in that way. Uh, You know, we've heard some really scary stories about the dog parks. 
you would think that dog parks are a good spot, but uh, especially as people were just coming out of their houses for the first time, dogs had a lot of pent up energy. They had gone a few months without that social interaction. So we're really looking at it from the safety of the human point of view and the dog point of view as well, and making sure that you keep all of those things in mind as you make these decisions. And Lee, um, part of your bit, most of your business seems to be okay, but part of it has been hurt by COVID, and that's the um, the meet events where you'd uh, you'd have a kind of I can't even picture this now, but speed dating. That's kind of been put on hold, right? It is. It has been put on hold. They were so much fun and we can't wait to get back to them. We've got great videos you can go see of people bringing their dogs, speed dating, meeting tons of different dog businesses in each city we go to. Um, But as a business, we've been able to take this opportunity over the last two months and completely redesign the app. So we're actually relaunching with new features, subscription tiers, you know, premium uh, ways of meeting other people through the app uh, in a way that as a small business, we didn't have time to do when we were traveling the country doing these dog friendly events. And so uh, even though we've been MIA in person, we're really excited to be able to offer people more opportunities because we've been home working on the app more. I, I'm curious about the premium approach. I mean, what what's a dating experience that I would pay slightly more money for on a subscription basis? A lot of people pay for their dating apps. No, Tinder is the highest grossing app on the app store uh, that's not in gaming. I mean, people look to different ways to make sure that they stand out. So maybe you're the first to show up in search for example. Um, maybe some of them you can only have photos, but you can add video if you're premium. So it's, uh, you know, dating apps take a look at the funnel of dating. Um, seeing a lot of people, who are you going to match with, who you're going to talk to, who you're going to give your number to, and who you're going to go out on a date to. And so if you think about that from a business perspective, it's each one of those layers, where can we make that a better experience for you? And where might that be a premium opportunity from a business side to really get you to stand out um, or to encourage you to have those conversations? And Lee, one of the things I look at your business financially, um, part I really in- enjoyed hearing was your sponsorship uh, connections, like you have, you call them partners, actually, with Purina and people like that. Um, Was that a tough sell in the beginning? And is it easier now? Was dogs and love a tough sell? No, people love it. People love it. Yeah, no. Uh, The business world has been really fascinating for us on both the dating and the dog side. We've really become a hub of pet influence in each city that we've held our events in because we really focused on introducing pet people in new ways. And we realized very quickly with our events, the vets were never meeting the uh, groomers and the local dog store owners were never meeting the people who were selling the mom and pop jerky, you know, for dogs or uh, vegan treats out of their garage trying to grow on the startup side. And so when we were having these events, we weren't just bringing together single dog lovers and dog owners, but the companies and also the rescues as well, having these personal interactions. And so from a from the very beginning, it was a hyper local growth. How can we meet uh, these companies of all sizes face to face with our dogs in tow, which of course, uh, we are a big promoter of because it relaxes and breaks down your walls, lets you have better conversations when you've got your a loved one by you already. Uh, and so really being able to interact with them on different levels. Now during COVID, all of these partners we've grown with uh, over the past few years We are helping each other by promoting each other. So we're showing some of our great partners on the app itself, in our newsletters, in our Raza newsletters, if you will. Uh, And so they're doing the same for us. And so it's it's a really deep, loving community of dog people promoting each other. So on that note, you're, you know, you're talking about an affinity group here, essentially, right? People who have one interest that they share in common, right? Um, I, one that sticks out to me is this is a, you know, it's app based, it's internet based. I feel like people are more gangbusters for cats. So I mean, like, is, is this something that you've thought about? All right, do we just like, you know, create an empire of animal dating apps? I mean, how, how do you expand into other affinity groups here? Or is that even in the cards? Are you guys ready to break some news on the Out to Lunch podcast? A thousand percent. <laughs> we are launching Tabby, the cat person's dating app. Oh my God. Beautiful. 
<laughs> and to answer your question of how, uh, you know, we've really built up this uh, incredible uh, way of connecting pet people. And like you said, the pet world was extraordinarily interested in it. And the dating world was interested in it because we're bringing uh, what you're calling is a, an affinity group, what we call is a lifestyle, because it's not just something you like together, but pets affect your entire lifestyle from how you spend your money, how clean you keep your home, how much you travel, um, your capacity to love. I mean, there's so much embedded in the idea of the pet. And so we knew there was a big opportunity out there. We got the cat question all the time. I could have bet that you were going to ask it. And so we knew that it was an opportunity out there. And the more we talked to cat people, because I'm not going to pretend to understand cat people as well as I understand dog people in any way. The more we talked to cat people, we realized dog people wanted a dating app to meet each other. Cat people need a dating app to meet each other. Uh, and when you take a look at the cat world through uh, the lens of dating apps, you see studies out there, I can, I can send you some, that on general dating apps, cat people do worse. It, men holding cats are seen as less masculine, um, less dateable, more potentially neurotic uh, in a lot of these studies. And between cat people, of course, that's not true. But you talk to cat people and they say, yeah, they get skipped over if they've got cats in their in their photos. Uh, and so we knew from the pet world that that's just not true between pet people, especially between cat people. They need their own space to be able to be the crazy cat lady they are and the cat dudes that they are. And so uh, I won't tell you yet. We're going to save a surprise, but uh, I'm not going to be the face of Tabby the way that my sister and I lead Dig. Uh, we, we're, we've got the structure for them, but we've got a, a few big cat influencers who are taking the reins and uh, working with us on Tabby, the cat person's dating app. Uh, we're actually launching it on International Cat Day, August 8th. Wow. Okay. Uh, so unusual breaking news for us. And, and Lee, you know, all the best to you as you conquer the world species by species. Lee D'Angelo is co-founder of Dig, the dog owners and lovers dating app. Lee, thank you so much for joining us on Out to Lunch Louisiana. Thank you, guys. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Out to Lunch Louisiana. We edited these conversations to fit into the time slot here on your NPR station. You can hear longer versions of these conversations wherever you normally get your Out to Lunch podcast. If you're not an Out to Lunch podcast subscriber, search for Out to Lunch, Out to Lunch Baton Rouge, or Out to Lunch Acadiana on your podcast app. At some point soon, we're going to go back to hosting out to lunch around the lunch table. For right now, Commander's Palace in New Orleans is closed, but you can have a range of ready to cook items shipped from Commander's Kitchen to yours anywhere nationwide. Information is at goldbelly.com. Our Lafayette Out to Lunch restaurant, The French Press, is open with 50% occupancy. So you can stop in to dine in or you can pick up their regular menu items or family dinner. You can get that delivered through Waiter or Grubhub. And in Baton Rouge, Mansur's on the Boulevard is also open. You can eat at the restaurant where they have 50% occupancy or outdoor dining. Or again, you can get that picked up. Out to Lunch Louisiana is a production of INO Broadcasting. The producer of our show is Grant Morris. Our technical director is Eric Merle. Photos from this show on our website and social media were taken by Jill LaFleur. I'm Christian Mader in Lafayette. Thanks for joining us today. Stephanie Regal will be back next week. I'm Peter Raschuti in New Orleans. We'll see you back here next week for more Out to Lunch, Louisiana. Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com and by Hancock Whitney. Hancock Whitney is here for families, here for businesses, here for communities during this challenging time. Visit HancockWhitney.com slash COVID-19 for the latest. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. Mitchell Foreman wrote and performs all the music on Out to Lunch. You can hear Mitchell's music anywhere great jazz is sold or streamed and at MitchellForeman.com. 